One, two, three. Hello, everyone. Thank you so very much for coming. Um, good morning. So happy welcome to this um, event that I'm so grateful for um, many colleagues who helped in getting this together, an amazing um, group of people that we're going to listen to in the, f in the next about um, 30 to 40 minutes. My name is Alex Nagel. I'm an assistant professor here in the art history department. And I love my students, they are all here, so thank you all for coming. Um, cheers, so um, we have um, yeah, a good crowd here. And um, my area of the uh, world is the Middle East and the um, Eastern Mediterranean, so an area um, that we also, yeah, the modern countries like Greece, Turkey, everything up, thing up until Iran. And uh, today's event actually is inspired by um, people, some people who come from this um, area. Uh, so we will have an archaeologist, Yanis Hamelakis, who will um, talk about his um, work on exciting um, projects he's doing since 2016. And uh, we were inspired in the first place, um, my colleague Amy Lemon, whom I'm grateful um, for having pushed uh, for this whole project. We got an award from the FIT Diversity Council for one year um, to invite speakers. And uh, we have a book that inspired us. It's called Look by Solma Sharif, um, an author um, who will be with us also next um, spring in the end of March. Um, and I will talk a little bit about the book um, later on. So Amy, thank you also for um, doing this. Um, I myself came just back from Crete about two weeks ago. I sent an email to my students and I made a phone, also a, a small video for them uh, from this beautiful island of Crete, um, so which is south in uh, Greece. Um, we have Greece and Turkey here on the map. So I was able to um, visit a few sites, archaeological sites on the island of uh, Crete. And I found these amazing um, specimens that they had on display in the museums there already um, about um, 3,000 years ago. People were obviously um, interested in creating kind of um, artifacts that um, talk about passing uh, through borders, that um, about uh, going on the Mediterranean. And people took care also of each other. So as you see in this little um, one here from about 1,000 BCE, um, a couple on a boat, um, perhaps, that is um, just um, crossing um, the ocean. So these were um, things that inspired me on this uh, trip only two weeks ago. And I just learned that actually um, the site where I was is not too far from where um, Yanis Hamilakis also was uh, growing up. So this is even more exciting um, for me. So um, before Yanis will speak uh, briefly about the book Solmaz Sharif that uh, influenced every um, thing we were doing in this uh, program. So Solmaz um, Sharif, a uh, Turkish-Iranian um, poet, um, published this book in 2016 called Look in response to um, actually very um, irritating uh, things that happened in the last couple of years here in the US also. Um, there is a dictionary that the uh, Department of Defense uh, published um, about words, how we should use um, certain words also. For instance, there's a definition for look also, and this whole militarization that um, is currently taking place um, um, here in the US um, particularly is something that I find very much of concern. So, um, and archaeologists, unfortunately, and this is a topic that Yanis Hamilakis has been working on for a long time already, um, are also uh, involved in, in some of these. And uh, now the language, when it comes to language, so we know also that um, uh, there's more and more terms like target that we use so easy in our um, word every, every day. So there's a meaning behind all of these words that we want to explore a little bit um, more. So today it's about um, yeah, the new nomadic age, this um, beautiful book, Archaeologies of Forced and uh, Undocumented Migration, which was published in 2018. And we have actually already sold a few copies upstairs, so if you want to, um, there are still copies left. Um, um, Janis will probably also be able afterwards to sign a few, I hope, um, for us. And um, Janis himself um, has been a thinker in um, archaeology and heritage um, already uh, for yeah, over 30 years now. He first um, did his um, um, MSc and uh, PhD um, in um, archaeology, environmental archaeology and paleo um, economy at uh, Sheffield, University of Sheffield in the UK. And this is also where he got a PhD from. He taught at universities in Southampton and University of Wales at Lumpet Lumpeter. He has been a member of the Princeton Institute of Advanced Studies and received um, awards already from the Getty Research Institute. 
and many other prestigious um, institutions. He was the keynote speaker for the World Archaeology Conference, um, um, a very important keynote speech also that has been uh, published um, about the embedded um, archaeologist. And all of, most all of his monographs have either won uh, or were nominated for prestigious prizes. 2007, he published The Nation and Its Ruins, Archaeology, Antiquity, and National Imagination in Modern Greece with Oxford which was the winner of the Edmund Keeley 2009 Book Prize. He published in 2013, Archaeologies and the Census, Human Experience, Memory, and Effect with Cambridge University Press. Um, he had a book, an edited volume on archaeology and capitalism from ethics to politics in 2007. And the list goes over 27 pages of um, Yanis um, CV, so I'm not going to um, go here into all of this. I'm hoping that Yanis will talk a little bit also about his um, um, yeah, upbringing and his um, um, look into the world. He's currently teaching at Brown University. There he's teaching courses on the past and the contemporary world, the archaeology of the census, and uh, on the decolonizing classical antiquity, colonialism, white nationalism, and classical material her heritage. And uh, one course in particular relevant for today, a migration crisis, question mark, displacement, materiality, and experience. He's also bringing students um, to Greece every summer. So or, or anyone here um, of my students who are interested in um, archaeology working with Yanis, um, there's always a spot also um, available um, in the summer. So um, without further ado, I think yeah, I let Yanis um, talk about um, the book. And thank you for being here. And thank you for welcoming Yanis. Well, thank you very much, Alex, for these very, very kind words. And thank you all for coming today. Um, it's my pleasure. It's, it's, I'm very glad to be here uh, amongst many good friends and colleagues and amongst so many interesting, creative uh, students. And I want to um, speak for 15 minutes or so or less about some of the things that we, are, um, we want to debate in relation to contemporary migration and how how should we as scholars, as artists, as photographers, as poets, um, should react to it, should actually position ourselves in relation to it. So uh, just before I talk about my work in relation to this and the book, um, I want to um, continue on what Alex was saying and say that this topic was something that um, I did not choose. Um, it chose me in the sense and it actually forced me to to engage with it. It's not something I did lightly, it's not something I did for career purposes or for um, other kind of reasons. I was working for many years on nationalism, as um, Alex said. I've struggled, I grew up and struggled with the apparatus of national states and national kind of imaginings, in my case in Greece. And I, I did a lot of work in trying to get out of that, deconstruct the various processes through which we were created, are created, I was created as a national being and as a national uh, citizen, uh, dealing with you know, the notion of borders, the notion of the essential continuity of the nation, the material dimensions of that kind of very suffocating, very often apparatus. I also did a lot of work on, on affect on sensoriality, and as an archaeologist, um, we all deal with objects, with materials, with the material fabric of the world and our, um, our experience. So I felt that when in 2015 and 16, the so-called the so migration crisis in the Mediterranean was all over the media, um, I felt that I needed to do something, uh, not only as an archaeologist who can say something about the material dimensions of the phenomenon, but also as a political being and as an activist who needed to, first of all, be there and witness, understand, and then have a, a say and an impact on, what's, on what was happening in, in that specific moment. And I said so-called migration crisis because I follow what many of my colleagues and others say in relation to that, that the term migration crisis is 
extremely problematic and does violence to that whole phenomenon. Um, it's not a migration crisis, it's a reception crisis. The crisis is not a crisis that was created by migrants. The crisis is a crisis of our own inability to receive, our own inability to welcome people from the global south, our own ability to deal with the last chapter in the long history, the latest chapter in the long history of colonialism and colonization. So what we are seeing today with the movement of people, mostly in the, you know, that border crossings from the global south to global north is another act of colonialism, another act of colonization. So I'm not, I'm, I'm saying that there are people who actually come from places that have long been uh, colonized and they in fact demand to be seen, demand to be heard, demand to have a presence in our own world. So, so it is upon us to reflect on why we find it so difficult to receive, to accept, to, to welcome people um, in their own attempt to create their own lives. So the book that um, Alex mentioned is a, not a single author book, uh, it's a collected edited volume. So what I'm doing here is to present, I'm presenting the work of many colleagues uh, coming from diverse backgrounds, uh, many archeologists, but also others from other disciplines, uh, some historians, some anthropologists, who have decided to reflect on what it means today for a scholar of archeology, span of anthropology, or for history, to deal with a specific phenomenon. How can we use, how can we retool our own perspectives to engage with this specific dimension and aspect? How can we mobilize our methodological and practical tools to say something that will be interesting, informative, creative, but also politically effective, politically um, powerful? in mobilizing affective reaction, but also in actually changing, changing the situation. And we're dealing with a situation which is a situation of um, securitization, um, a situation of uh, deportation. Uh, anthropologists and others talk about the deportation regime as a framework that actually defines the reaction of nation states, institutions, um, and organizations like the European Union. So many people in this country, of course, know and they are exposed to the discussion about the Mexico-US border, another major uh, entry from the global south to the global north. But the Mediterranean, where I work, is another major um, entry point and another major kind of borderscape in that uh, phenomenon of, of migration. And the European Union is the agency in this case which actually manages that specific borderscape, and it's the one that actually implemented a series of measures to affect that specific regime of um, securitization uh, and the apparatus uh, of deportation. So I want to go through some of the material facets of this specific borderscape and show you how I go about to work through that phenomenon. How as an archeologist, the archeologists in this case of the contemporary moment, the archeologists of the present can actually relate to that specific experience. So um, my focal point in terms of my own work is um, the island of Lesbos, a border island, an island between Turkey and, and Greece, but also one of the entry points for many, many years, for centuries between the global south and the global north. And that island is very interesting. It's only in its narrowest kind of passage, it's only about three to four miles um, to Turkey, to the Turkish coast. At this very moment, if you actually go on the island, you'll see that that crossing, that very, very short crossing is in fact a, a fence. It's in fact a mobile fence. It's a kind of a securitized and militarized fence. So you see ships like this, it's the Frontex, it's the militarized wing of the European Union that patrols the passage all the time to actually uh, prevent any border crosses to cross from Turkey into Greece. Um, in that Greece and Turkey border, the land border is in Ev on Evros, uh, up in the north. That land border has been securitized for many years now, so the passage over there is now much more difficult and problematic. 
So many people who want to cross use the, the liquid boat or use the passage, the sea passage between Turkey and Greece through the islands, Lesbos, but also the islands of Samos, of Hios, um, and other islands, smaller islands. But if you look on the island of, of, of Lesbos, you'll see that it is an island of migrants themselves. It's an island that, uh, especially um, the town of Mytilene, is actually populated by people who came from the opposite coast, people who came from Turkey, and they were um, migrants who were exchanged during the exchange with populations following the Lausanne Treaty in 1922 and uh, before that, the Greek-Turkish War. So they celebrate, they commemorate, they remember that heritage of migration on the islands, but very often, they want to make a break, they want to actually establish a, a rupture between that history and the contemporary moment. Where some solidarity initiatives and others want to remember that and want to make the connection clear, others want to forget it. Um, so for example, on this photo, you see um, a street sign to Sinikismos, which means settlement, which is where uh, all the migrants settled in 1922. And under it, you will see a little graffiti from one of the small NGOs to, to actually make that kind of connection visible. And in fact, the island itself is full of monuments which testify to the multicultural, multi-faith, and multi-religious kind of um, uh, presence and history of that uh, specific locale. Island uh, monuments like this, which lie, as you say, ruined and are not um, are not used um, for you know religious or other even heritage kind of uses. Whereas the thousands and thousands of people of Muslim faith who are on the island do not actually have a place of wor worship because many of them are in in detention camps. So, um, in the interest of time, I want to go through quickly some of the facets of the phenomenon. Um, for, for you to um, understand what's happening in the global, in the scale of both Mediterranean and European kind of uh, uh, picture, you'll see that this is a typical picture you will see in the media or in other organizations. First of all, uh, terminology of illegality, and then visual, the visualization of an invasion. Very often, that kind of vision of um, a country like Greece or Italy or Spain being invaded by people from Africa or Asia is the trope that we are used to in the media. And we are, um, we are attempting, so many of us and others are attempting to actually uh, work against that specific mentality. The European Union has done a kind of externalization of its borders. Very often what it does is to pay countries like Turkey, to pay countries like Spain, to stop migrants before they reach the coast. So they're pushing the border southwards and eastwards. Today, Turkey, and to some extent Greece, operate as buffer zones. Buffer zones in the mentality of what is Europe. And this is something that doesn't happen only in the European Union, happens also in, in the US in relation to uh, Central um, American countries. It happens to other parts of the world. But it's a new kind of approach, the approach of externalizing, exporting the border, expanding the border. And the other mentality, the other regime is that of prevention through deterrence is the name of this country. A similar practice is happening in the Mediterranean. Prevention through deterrence meaning make, let's make their life hell so they will not come. Yeah, make it much more difficult for them to come or uh, impossible and therefore they will not, which of course doesn't work. What it does, it results in more death. And I want to quickly show you this um, statistic from today's data of the International Migration Organization uh, from a specific kind of project called the Missing Migrant Project. And you can see that in the world today, the Mediterranean is the deadliest crossing. These are the fatalities of the people who went missing this year alone, 2019. You can see the numbers uh, all over the world. You can see that more than 1,000 people actually perished or uh, um, got um, missing in the Mediterranean as a result of that policy of fortress Europe, of securitization. So a lot of what I do I, when I go to the island is uh, I, I am there as a witness to that phenomenon and I'm there as somebody who records materially, photographically, through descriptions, 
through video and photography and interviews also the situation on the ground. One of my key sites in terms of my own ethnography is this specific uh, camp, is the notorious camp of Moria, the main uh, camp on the island, which is many things at once. It's a place where people, all of all migrants have to go through to be registered, so the registration center. It's also a place where they have to apply for asylum, so it's an asylum application center, but it's also a center for imprisonment. So there's inside it, there's a sector called the pre-departure facility. So this is a euphemism for deportation, the pre-departure facility. That is a high security prison uh, in which you are locked in until you actually get reported. And there is also an extensive um, settlement of migrants who live around that, that specific kind of center of Moria. So um, just briefly, I mean, this is um, a work we're trying to do through Google Images, actually trying to understand the organization of this camp. You can see the various sectors, but also have a look at this. This is a recent aerial image of that camp, and you can see that it's growing bigger and bigger because there are more people who are coming on the island. They cannot move out of the island because of the European Union treaty with Turkey that was signed in 2016. They have to stay on the island until their case is heard, um, a case of asylum, and that means that there is an increasing number of people in under very, very difficult conditions. So these are the conditions that are actually faced on that camp today. And of course, the technologies of detention are there to be seen, very often performing a specific role, the role of kind of the image of hospitalization, because there are attempts, there are ways to actually get in and out of this camp. There are many passages, there are many crossings, but um, it is important, I think, for the security apparatus to actually depict that kind of image of securitization through razor wire and other kind of technologies. It's important for the image they want to depict and also to emit in the global media and to domestic media and domestic audiences as well. So um, I could speak in at length about various kinds of facets of work, for example, about provision of food, which is centralized through um, a catering company, which has to prepare everyday meals for 14,000 people three times a day. And in most cases, people do not actually eat the food because what they say to me is that this is food for ill people. It's not fit for consumption. So what they do very often is actually prepare their own food. They actually construct their own huts, construct their own cooking facilities to al allow them to take care of their own body and their own life through that. So what I want to send as an image here and as a kind of message is not only a message of securitization, which is what uh, we are seeing, but also a message of agency uh, and initiative. What I see on the island, what I have seen in other cases, is a movement, which is a political movement as well. And there is agency on the part of the migrant. There are attempts, there are various attempts to actually take control of their own life, either through food provision, but also through other initiatives. And I want very briefly to show you a few images because I know we don't have time. So facilities that are actually used like tanus, the um, sunken, um, oven that is actually common in the Middle East for the preparation of food. You can see several of them be constructed by migrants who may be there for a year or two on that camp, but they feel that they have to create these material conditions for their own life and their own experience. So I want to um, show both their own initiatives, but also the initiatives of uh, NGOs and others and, and groups like uh, solidarity groups like No Borders Initiative, which actually emphasize um, in this case, the case of Lesbos food. Demonstrations are common on the island. Political initiatives, groupings, representation, but also revolts are happening regularly on that specific camp. So these are things we don't actually hear in the media because the dominant kind of image very often is of the migrant either as a, as a, as a threat or as a victim. So I want to foreground and portray and, and talk to you and with you about the image of a migrant as a political being who actually has agency. And even the label migrant or refugee is something that we need to reflect on and think about and think of the violence it does in terms of homogenization 
of one person's experience. I've met people coming from all sorts of life, and they're temporarily there as migrants or refugees, but they want to be much more than that, and they do much more than that. So after revolts and kind of demonstrations, they would often send me photos of the police brutality and the tear gas canisters that actually the police used to clamp down on their own demonstrations. Again, around inside and around major towns like this one. But I want to show also what they do in their own initiative. This is a photo that I took this past summer. A group of friends of mine who are from Afghanistan, migrants themselves, teachers in Afghanistan, now migrants on the camp, what they do here is to construct their own schools. As school initiatives, as you see, they reuse material that they find around, uh, like tarpaul, like uh, pallets, and small libraries like this, to you know, take control of their life, their education, and their actually uh, experience in the journey, in actual, actual journey from the island, because they do want to continue their journey into mainland Greece and then into um, northern European countries. They, many of them do not want to stay uh, in, in Greece itself. Um, the initiatives like this are not actually welcomed by the authorities of the camp, and they are not welcomed by major NGOs either, because they go against an image of a migrant as a victim or a person to be processed through various bureaucratic apparatuses. This is an initiative that they took themselves. They decided to teach through the medium of um, uh, FASI or other languages their own, you know, their own things to, 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 to children uh, that would actually do not go to any formal school or any other schooling process. So the sc this specific school has actually been demolished by the authorities of the camp a couple of times and they rebuilt it because they want to continue having that kind of agency and ability to shape and reshape their own lives. So these are some of the things I've been experiencing and doing. I want to finish because I want to allow for my co-panelists to, um, to present their own work. One of the things we are doing as archeologists is also to record and perhaps collect some of the remnants of the border crossing. People are aware of the live vest as an iconic image of that specific um, experience of water crossing through the sea. There is a site near Molivos on the north of Lesbos called the Life Best Cemetery. This is the name that media gave to it, New York Times and other media, and it's already becoming a heritage space. We can call it a dark heritage space. This is a space we visited with a small group of students from Brown because we wanted to understand that specific assemblage of materials and understand also what it says about that experience of border crossing. So it took actually um, weeks for us to do a proper archeological recording of that as an archeological site uh, through survey, but also through a small scale excavation. What this meant was that we valorized this specific assemblage as an assemblage of value, not as the rubbish, not as the pollution, which is, is resulted through the border crossing, but as something that can actually give us information, but also an insight into the experience of border crossing and also engender affectivity. We have, we have gathered and collected selectively, and I emphasize selectively, a very, very small number of these objects, which we felt were important to collect in order for, for them to become active and become agents of the messages we want to send. So um, many of the life vests we collected, uh, some of them we collected are now part of the small collection we have at Brown University, and we're preparing a new, a new exhibition called Transit Matter, which is going to open at our ethnographic museum in February. So I know that many of you are curators, or you're starting to be curators, so I would welcome your views on how one can actually represent, how one can curate or show that experience of border crossing in the space of a gallery today. What are the ethical, the political, the epistemic issues that we need to be aware about? I constantly think about it, and I believe that it is not an easy thing to do. It's not straightforward, and it's a material that actually poses very, very serious challenges to us. I'll finish by something, um, a minor detail. When we were actually looking at all these things, we realized that the vast majority of those uh, life vests are not actually 
real life vests in the sense that they were not produced by the company they say they are produced. And that means that they do not actually abide by the buoyancy regulations. They may not float, in fact. So what we did was to examine many of them, tear them apart, examine the staffing, and we realized that in most cases, the staffing inside is not the bubbly one you would expect to find, so it can actually float. It's a spongy one that actually absorbs water as opposed to you know, make the device float. It, they were made in small workshops on the Turkish coast, and they were sold to migrants uh, for the crossing. So that was one interesting kind of result of our archaeological exercise to show that there is an industry that actually goes with that border crossing that results in immaterialities that require attention because they may also have serious, serious effects for the people who use them. But these materials are also transformed by migrants themselves. So on the island of Lesbos, there are workshops right now to upcycle the materials of, board, of uh, border crossing, like the life vest, into various objects, like bags, like purses, like other material that can then travel, circulate globally, and carry with them the message of solidarity, because for them that is um, key to send, and at the same time provide uh, an income, a uh, small income for the people who work on those workshops. So these are some of the issues I wanted to um, show to you and to actually raise with you to facilitate the discussion in the Q&A, and thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Yanis. So um, I think there's a lot of food for thought already in the assemblage of values and the project um, that Yanis is doing. I want to uh, move now actually to a poetry. Um, we have uh, one really esteemed um, young um, poet here in the audience today. Marwa Helal is a poet and a journalist. Um, Marwa um, is actually um, uh, currently also teaching here at FIT. Uh, she received an MFA in creative uh, uh, nonfiction from the New School and a BA in journalism and international studies from Ohio Wesleyan University. And her work appeared um, in yeah, Hyperallergic, in uh, Apogee, Poet and Writers, um, quite a number of distinguished um, um, out, uh, outlets. Um, one book in 2017, I Am Made to Leave and I Am Made to Return, no dear small anchor press um, got high um, praise as got this most recent volume and i hope that marva will perhaps read from invasive species this watch only published in 2019 there are also copies of this um, poetry volume on uh, on the stairs marva herself uh, was born in egypt um, but has been living here in uh, brooklyn already for uh, quite some time and so she's hopefully yeah getting her experience also about um, migration, the nomadism, also the idea of moving uh, from one place um, to, to the other. Thank you so mu very much, Mava, and um, thank you for yeah, giving a shout out. Hi, how's everybody doing? Um, thank you so much, Professor Nagel and Professor Lemon for getting us together. Um, I'm so happy to be in conversation with you, Professor Hamilakis, and I do already have this copy. Um, please get yours, uh, The New Nomadic Age. And as a kind of bridge between the conversation you started and the poems I'll read, um, I wanted to actually share uh, a quote from your book, uh, which I included in a review that's coming out in Art Forum um, very soon, uh, in hopes that other educators and editors and curators will be called to read this. And the quote that I want to share is actually from um, Nashreem, one of the young girls um, who migrates to Lesbos. She says, for some people, life jackets prove we are the devil in their house. And for some, they stand for humanity and the right to live in dignity. As for myself, I don't want to see a life jacket again in my life. Even when I see this vivid orange color somewhere else, 
My mouth turns bitter like I have swallowed seawater. My breathing becomes heavy like I am drowning. No more life jackets ever again, I hope. So yeah, thank you for your uh, witnessing and documenting. Uh, my book, Invasive Species, which uh, I was recently asked by a class of undergraduates at George Washington University in St. Louis, uh, well, why would you call yourself that? Uh, you have to read the book to, to find out the full story, but I will say, um, you know, when you're already kind of perceived as a so-called threat, right? Like, that's sort of how um, the media and other images, images in the imagination would paint us, uh, then it's very easy to sort of take on that title and kind of lean in, right, so to speak, uh, into the demonization of the migrant or immigrant. And a lot of my work just uh, tries to actually decolonize or actually recolonize, I prefer to say, um, the English language through forms and um, the language itself, right? So here's poem to be read from right to left. I learned my first language second. C, C. Native I am mistaken for everywhere I go. To sun and moon, like the letter lamb. Sound like lamb, but think like fox. Reminds me of this recurring dream, being chased in a circle, like duck, duck, goose, but there were no other children. I got tired of counting the number of English words it takes to capture one in another. Um, and I just want to thank everybody that came to the Vernacular as Resistance workshop, I think it was last week, um, uh, for engaging with that poem and you know trying to make your own. It was a lot of fun. Um, another form that I like to use is the beautiful outlaw which is actually uh, from the French school of poetry, the Wulipian school, if some of you may have heard of it. Um, and you know, being from a part of Egypt that was colonized by the French, um, it's a kind of reclamation to use a kind of erasure form to reclaim our erasure. So like the erasure of the Africanness of Egypt, uh, the co-opting of North Africa into the Middle East. So all of these kinds of topics are explored in the work. This is the Middle East is missing. What do Osama bin Laden and I have in common? Saddam, Gaddafi, Mubarak, Sharon, Perez, is Kashmir, is Asia, is Persia, is Europe, is Iran, is Jordan, is Kurd a language, a religion, cuisine, borders on bordering? What do you and I have in common? Red Sea, Dead Sea, an empire, Syria, Iraq, say Kurd, say we were occupied, a people under siege of make xenophobia believe, drink and say Zemzem. Say we did it to ourselves, say complicit, I want to walk, return maps, speak to managers of map makers. I'd like to see God's atlas, compare it to ours, trace a new equator, a river Nile still running, Azur, Azur, upwards its own gravity joint scapegoat to scapegoat in song. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream times three. Say je suis Zidane, je suis Egyptienne. Say it to a rhythm, not a plot, a quality, not a toxin. Say dizzy, without jury, without trial. Ask of us, just us, sing back lyric, dust off vulgar gaslight. Say it in the colonizer's tongue. Call it the cradle of civilization. Say dunya, say la ilaha illallah. Say jannah, inscribe your history inside every barren closet you once occupied. Say quickly, here we are now, entertain us. Cartographers, agitate us, exact us, excise us. Would you make a space for me between zoot jute epoxy and a hard place? Somewhere between vengeance and yoke next to the place you go to quake. I've brought my own pillow plus sleeping bag, but now the letters have become cryptic. I can't tell if it is because of shyness or lack of interest. When you look like me, you can say things no one will question or everyone will question you in June as a zygote in uterus in excess. Maybe it is a cry for help. Maybe it is just a cry. 
Say Palestinian, say Palestine, say Syria, say Syrian, say baby, say future, say mine, say Yemen, say Yemeni, say Zay, say Hina, say mine, say ghost in context, weep quietly, then wail. So make a space for me in your mind. Make me a space. Graph, transcribe, jaunt, wax, wane. Here is Neruda, here is his book of questions, here is mine. A quiz of sorts, this is the map I navigate by. Who you pulling from bricks? A baby, an arm, books, a ball. Whose is it, you ask? Coaxing at gallons of quicksand, absorbing and vying for joy for protozoa. Pray static, pray draw, pray Zoroastrian, pray Xanax, pray quickly, borrow what you will from God, from vagrancy, from vacancy. Before I left, I wrote, where are you from? Where are you from? Where are you from? Inside every empty closet of the homes I once occupied, don't forget where you're from. Don't squint, zoom in, stow the box, lock the key, jump on. We made a new map from breath, from zone to zone. We moved, traveled, walked, journeyed. There are many who experience what we haven't, quote, benefited from being, unquote. Maybe a cry for help, maybe just a cry. Maybe a memory quivering of a juvenile kingdom's lie. Maybe was a zealous royal who unleashed sand and sphinx, making borders die in yellow, blue, green, and red, orange, and cream lines. Thank you. Um, and the middle of the book is a kind of uh, memoir, lyric essay. So you have the option to read it either as poems or as prose. It's up to, up to you. Um, and I'm just going to read letter C to close. Uh, census. In the summer of 2000, there was a knock on our front door. Then the doorbell rang. My father answered it. Hello? Hi, I'm from the Census Bureau. Do you have a few moments to answer a few follow-up questions about your census form? Sure. She looked down at her clipboard. Well, sir, it looks like you checked a few boxes for race, although it says there are only five people in your household. Yes. How's that possible? Previously, my father had checked the form white, non-Hispanic, African, African-American, multiracial, and other. Hang on, please, just one second. He loudly called out, Yaza, Marwa, Hatim, yes, sir. We gathered at the entrance in the order he called us. Look at my family and tell me what you see. A biology professor, my father enjoyed challenging his students in the same way. She looked over our faces, each of us a different shade, ranging from my mother's ivory skin to my father's dark summer brown. My brothers and me, the gradients between. My father went on with his lesson. She may as well have come over to ask about the binomial nomenclature of some plants in the yard. We are from Egypt. A fan of the Socratic method, he went on. Do you know where Egypt is? Africa, she replied hesitantly. Would this qualify us as African American? He didn't wait for her answer this time. We get mistaken for just about everything around here, and not one of us is the same color as the other. So, he paused, I checked everything that applied. By 1924, there were about 200,000 Arabs living in the United States, and by 2000, at least 3.5 million Americans were of Arab descent. It is 2010, a census form arrives in the mail. I check other and write in A-R-A-B. In 2016, Obama wants to add a new racial category and has chosen an acronym to describe a group of people, M-E-N-A, Middle Eastern and North African. I note the absence of the word Arab. Still, they do not sense us. So, a few notes, there's a lot of footnotes in this book, but some of them got left out in the editing process. So how does the Arab become white in the United States? Um, a group of businessmen in Detroit knew that in the 1950s they couldn't get business loans if they didn't identify as white, and so Arabs become complicit in racism. That's one. Second, nor most North Africans were actually colonized by the Arabs, so to call them Arabs is a kind of other lie. Um, so the Arab becomes this kind of like mythical creature that doesn't exist. 
And then additionally, um, you know, Arabs are being killed everywhere because of imperialism, because of US involvement in Iraq, Afghanistan. Afga Afghanistan does not have Arabs, but is considered part of the Arab racial group raci through racialization of terrorism, Islam, et cetera. Whole other conversation we can have. Um, Iraq, Yemen, um, through the US's support of Saudi Arabia bombing uh, Yemenis. So, uh, you know, I don't really know what an Arab is. Like, you know, we speak Arabic. Um, some of us are Muslim, most of us are not actually. Um, I could go on and on, but I'm looking forward to Stephen's uh, presentation. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Wow, Marwa, thank you so very much for um, this. So, um, words, um, things mean um, also a lot. So now we are moving actually to photography. Stephen uh, Molina Contreras. Um, was born in 1999 in El Salvador, um, came to the U.S. at uh, the age of six, and his mom, Alma, is also here with us in the audience today. <laughs> so, um, Stephen is currently a student here at the um, IFT and is just in his final year finishing a BFA in photography and digital media. He already worked at uh, the Saturday Night Live photography department and has published some of his um, photographies in like the New York Times, Washington Post, Time, um, Vanity Fair, U Magazine here. So um, his work is currently on view at Mana Contemporary in New Jersey and in an exhibition that you see here right at the entrance um, of FIT. Um, he also has exhibited um, in a Sunset Sunrise in 2019 in BX Spaces in Brooklyn and into the glass box in 2018 here at FIT. So um, he's now talking about um, a project, um, Mi Familia Emigrante, and I'm really honored also, Stephen. You are a student in my class, you are a top student, so thank you for <laughs> doing this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. thank, of course, uh, Professor Nagel and Professor Lemon for inviting me and reaching out in September uh, to be a part of this conversation. And of course, I want to thank uh, Giannis and Marwa for just really inspiring me just to see how both of you are kind of working um, with themes professionally and how you're advocating and inspiring um, a new generation of thinkers um, and people dealing with immigration. Um, so of course, my name is Stephen Molina Contreras. I was born in El Salvador and I came here when I was six. The core of my work deals with immigration issues and how documented and undocumented people kind of congregate, right? How we make our own spaces and how in my family specifically, we're working to reclaim our own narrative and we're working to kind of um, just explore what it means to be a family in, in just separated places. Um, and I, that wasn't what the core of my work was at the beginning when I really started thinking about photography conceptually, um, but it all kind of came from this catalyst moment of um, my stepfather, um, my mother's husband, um, was applying to become a U.S. citizen, to be applying to become a U.S. resident. They were married in 2013 and my mother was a U.S. citizen already and he was undocumented. But because of their marriage and because of their love, they were able to kind of finally find a clear path for his um, documentation, for him to apply to become a citizen. Um, so from 2013 on, I'd say that um, they were constantly working with different lawyers, with different people, um, to get one a U.S. pardon for him so that he can apply to become a citizen, um, and for two, for him just to have the opportunity to do it. Um, but it wasn't until late 2017 that kind of everything was solidified, right? Everything was checked out, and um, the way it had been agreed was that uh, my stepfather, Lenin, would have to be deported or would have to leave the country to return to his home country in Peru. Um, to one, be interviewed to prove their marriage, my mother's marriage, that it was real, that it was out of love, and that it was out of passion. And to two, for him to formally come back to the United States, right, legally, through planes. So it was kind of this mix of formalities and paperwork and just different things worked out um, after his pardon. And they had planned for three weeks. And my mother at the time also was going down there um, for about a week to just um, be interviewed as well. And when the three-week mark came around, um, he missed his flight, not because he overslept, not because he didn't make it, but because none of the paperwork had been worked out for him to come back into the U.S. And my mother was here, and we kind of found out everything kind of really quickly, and 
Then three weeks turned into four weeks, nothing had happened. Four weeks turned into two months, still nothing happened, and he was in Peru. Um, two months turned into three, and well, at the three and a half month mark, he finally comes back to us, and he's finally able to um, pursue a residency and eventually a citizenship in the US. But you can imagine that in those three months, three and a half months that we didn't plan for, it was a really tough and difficult time for my family, um, specifically for my mother. Uh, my mother makes an honest living. She's a great hairdresser. She does a lot of pastoral studies. She's a wonderful woman. But without my stepfather um, in the US, there was definitely a financial and a parental um, need. There was, there was this void that was left behind and there was this kind of just hardship that my mother um, did not want to face alone, and I don't think she would want to or, or could face alone. So she had asked me to return home periodically um, to kind of keep up with the timeline. Um, at the end of January in 2018, right, he's now gone for about one and a half months, um, I returned to college. And during that time, my mother had asked if I could come home every weekend to take care of my baby sister on Saturdays to babysit, do the general things that my stepfather would do. And I reluctantly um, while I was stressed between college and classes, just went um, and started photographing. Uh, I didn't come in with the intent to show images of my family or the things that we were experiencing with my stepfather gone, um, but I did come in to fulfill assignments for my major. Um, and through that process of um, just shooting at home, I started to see things, or my professor started to see things that I subconsciously was experiencing. Um, I was photographing my mom in really emotional stages and in, in, in places that weren't necessarily um, beautiful per se, right? There was definitely a lot of pain in the story, but my professor saw that there was something kind of evolving from the images that I was taking, that there was um, a larger conversation about what happens when um, do documented and undocumented people um, go through these processes, and that's what kind of the core of my work is about. Um, so I started shooting my mom in and around our house. Um, I started using black and white uh, portraiture to kind of riff off the history of that medium and how it's been used to document, of course, migrants, but just in a general sense, um, people. And I kind of really liked how these black and white images um, kind of pushed this emotional narrative that my family was experiencing. So I started just taking portraits in and around the house of my mother, going to work um, every morning that I was with her, um, and things that I kind of found interesting and that I've never looked at before until this situation came about. Um, this is an image of me uh, kind of reflected um, in between a portrait of my mom's wedding um, and my stepfather. And I kind of saw that because he was gone that I, need to, I needed to step into this role of a father figure and that I needed to be what she needed me to be. And I had to figure that out. Um, so this kind of portrait um, relates to that idea. And then I started kind of collaborating with my mom and we started kind of um, just really thinking about like how we needed to be there for each other and how that emotional aspect uh, changed our relationship. And actually up to this point, um, I'd say that me and my mother had a fine relationship. I don't think I really ever considered um, just exactly what that was. And because we didn't have the luxury of not exploring that during this time, we really did have to figure out um, who we needed to be and what we needed to be for each other and what emotional support um, we needed, and that's when the larger conversation of immigration really started coming into my life because I really started to realize about the privilege that I had to coming to the U.S. at the age of six through my mother's hard work um, legally, right? Uh, and I really started to kind of think about, wow, now I'm really in the situation where I fear that my stepfather might not come back or my mother fears that this might not work out, right? So I am started to think about just all those different things and just these kind of quirky still lives that my mom has around the house of like Statues of Liberties. Um, I start to think about different things that step in for growth ideas of Latin heritage, um, specifically with this one being a soccer trophy that my stepfather had won at a tournament, um, and this uh, Statue of Liberty that we found at our house. And then I, did we just continue photographing throughout the time. And so my, uh, my mother and my stepfather actually have one US born daughter named Abigail who was at this time one and a half years old. She is the only one that was a natural born citizen and she had to have that experience of the stepfather being gone. So there was a lot of like emotional um, complexity with that. I think even in her, even though she was one and a half year old, I did start to notice a lot of separation anxiety. Um, just when my mother would leave for work or when I would be babysitting her, there was definitely like this, this cry and emotional pain for a father that I had to step in and my mother had to step in and fill as well. So this is like every night when we'd come in and put her to bed as well. And I was just 
I really was looking at my mother and feeling and feeling her pain and feeling that emotion of, of um, being immigrants and really just experiencing it for the first time and kind of waking up to my own um, reality. This is a portrait of my older sister, Jamie, who is amazing, but at the same time um, had to go through this alongside with us. She's now older, so she's a little bit outside of the house, um, but we were both definitely collaborating, helping my mother um, with the things missing. And then I started to think about how I didn't want it just to use documentary photography. I didn't want to just do snapshot things. I didn't want to be voyeuristic. I wanted to collaborate with her. I wanted to see what we can make together based on that experience so that we can really reach this intimacy. And we took this photograph um, kind of to mark the fact that our relationship was growing and that um, we both support each other and that we both finally look at each other. And funny enough, in the sequence of this, um, of this slideshow, um, a lot of people think that's my stepfather and that's the marker of him returning, but it's actually me. I'm the one in the photograph. And I'm kind of using that kind of perception at first, if you're not looking, to make you think that he's back, but he has yet to return, or, and I'm just stepping into to his place. The great thing about my story is that, of course, he does return. And I kind of make this shift from black and white to color because I do feel like there's a new breath in my house. There's a new stillness, there's this glowing, there's this kind of um, just brand new experience that I hadn't seen before in my family. And because he was able to become a US citizen, um, I saw, him, I saw him in a new light. I saw a lot of opportunity to him. And I also paid a lot of respect to him because I realized the things that he had, he had to go through to become um, you know, my stepfather, to become my, father's, my mother's husband, and just all the challenges that he faced. But in the midst of that, um, and actually me and uh, Dr. Giannis were actually speaking about this, I saw that he wasn't, when he came back, he wasn't trying to make himself a victim. He, he completely took the experience, my family took the experience, and kind of moved on and really kind of started reconstructing immediately. And, and I really started thinking about how, what's it called, this narrative of reconstruction parallels really well with a lot of immigra immigrants, of people who are just looking to build their own land, who are looking just to survive in a place that they can finally call home. And my mother and my stepfather entered this period of rebuilding my house, and I just kind of started now shooting voyeuristically, seeing how other things could stand in for each other. And I just, I, I just, continued shooting. And there was these parallels between two doorways. I liked having kind of him far away and then you see in the conglomerated mess of my house in ruins, but them actively building to restore it. Um, building on the foundation that's already there and um, just working with what they got. And I think that's a really beautiful parallel to what you, uh, Marwa and Dr. Giannis were speaking that, of course immigrants are coming to find a new home, but they're also making their own home. They're, we're not all necessarily looking for handouts or looking for victimization. We're looking just for opportunities to create our own space and opportunities to um, learn from one another and of course the cultures that we're coming into. Um, and I finally made this kind of formal portrait of my family that is actually a little crooked. It's a little off-centered, but at the center of the whole thing is just my mother in this kind of beat up throne and it's all of us looking a little standoffish but at the same time, um, I think with a, 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 a sense of cultural resilience. And uh, I think I really love all of their kind of gazes um, at you and the way that they look at you and they, the way that they're kind of telling you, come look, but this is what we've built. And I also, my family was uh, very much inspired by um, religious um, beliefs, uh, I think faith had a lot to play, both faith in each other and both faith in God for my mother and for my stepfather. And I wanted to kind of play off of that as well, how a lot of immigrants, at least from Latin America and more specifically from El Salvador, do have this higher sense of belief um, to push them through these situations to get them to be as culturally resilient as they are. And to mark off this ending, while the project is not done, of course, um, I did want to finally make an image of my mother and my stepfather embracing beautifully at this beach that we live down the street by. Um, they were married on a beach. Um, they spend a lot of time at the beach. Um, and I just wanted to see them together to celebrate the fact that they were able to get through this. Um, and it started with my stepfather's deportation, right? It started from him going to Peru and trying to be a citizen 
to then evolving about my relationship with my mother, to then evolving um, to reconstruction. But in reality, the whole narrative or the one constant or dependent variable in the situation was my mother and was the fact that she really created this matriarchy that many, many mothers, and more specifically many Latin American mo mothers, um, really take on heavily. And I made one final portrait of her um, kind of looking to the future, kind of echoing that same photo of my baby sister at the beginning and how I used people's profiles to look ahead, but her looking to the future and her looking to move on from this really difficult experience um, and take from it. And the fun part about this photograph for me is the fact that while she's here in the foreground, in the background, if you really take the moment to look closer, um, there's my stepfather and there's my baby sister happily playing in a space where they aren't afraid um, to be taken away from each other. Um, and yeah, so a lot of my work deals with this kind of narrative and this starts as a catalyst to me exploring my El Salvadorian heritage and what it does mean to be documented and what it does mean um, for my family members who want to be, uh, who want to be documented or who want to cross different borders. Um, more recently, I went to El Salvador in April um, to finally kind of reconnect with my father, but I had a lot of conversations with family members that I didn't expect to have that kind of echo some of the same thoughts that um, Marwa and Yanis have. While they weren't as expressive as the both of you were, there was this sense of we want to come to different places, to different countries to, to work, to provide opportunities, to become part of that society because where we are now um, isn't, isn't working. And I think that's an important thing to just remember as we're all here in this room um, that, there's a, that immigrants don't have the, the only narrative isn't victimization. It isn't about we need to help them, but they're here to help us as much as we should um, be helping them. Um, thank you guys for coming today and for listening to my work. I would like to ask now Yanis Hamilakis and Marva Hilal um, to come to the front also, so for a bit of Q&A. So before I'm going to open the floor for um, questions maybe to the speakers, to three amazing artists, I have to say. So um, Yanis, although he's an academic, I think um, he showed us today also that academics are also artists in some way. Um, yeah, Marvar, um, no question. I mean, this is amazing. So with your um, language, you um, really yeah, brought us to the beauty again of words back. And Stephen, again, I mean, fantastic um, approach. Um, dignity is one term that also in the volume actually, uh, Janis, that you um, uh, co-authored the new nomadic age um, appears already in the very first um, uh, words that you write. There's a scene um, about a young uh, child also um, that y whom you encountered there also and uh, so there was a, uh, it's a fantastic actually opening for this book. Um, so one of the questions that I would have also is about people's right to forget, and you address this also in your volume, um, in your introduction. Many of these um, people who are currently on the move, all of us in some ways also, we want to forget um, also some of these parts. Um, maybe, Janis, you can address this, um, how this is uh, part of your um, work also on Lesbos or generally on the whole phenomenon. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a key issue, Alex, and thank you for bringing it um, to our conversation. Um, the life vests that you, you know, the passage that you um, read is something that actually concerns me a lot, and I think about it all the time, because we m made one single object, an iconic image of a very complex phenomenon. And I understand why you've made that, and I understand the symbolic value of the life vest right now, uh, many people use it as, a, as an icon of solidarity. But as you said, and as I have seen in, in my own work and the interviews and the conversations I had with many people, this is not necessarily something they themselves want to valorize. Mm -hmm. It's something, well, one specific moment in a long journey. It represents that crossing which lasts a few hours. And I know people, many people I've met are on the road for years. And they are also forward-looking, 
They are dreaming of their new life somewhere else. So that specific moment, yes, it was painful in some ways, it was stressful, it was, but it, they don't want to be defined by that. So right now, as I said, I am in the process of curating this exhibition at Brown. We have brought several life vests. Uh, it was important for us also to show uh, that many of them are not real, they were made on the, on the coast of Turkey. We brought some that are recycled from old decommissioned ships. So for, as an archeologist, it was important for us to show that materiality and its own itinerary, its own biography. But we are thinking that in the gallery space, we may want to have a small part with the life vest and devote the rest of the gallery to other facets of their life. For example, to connect also with the, the photographic work you're doing. Um, I have started a project of, um, with, with them, uh, a photo, auto photo ethnography in some ways, auto ethnography through photography. So I'm collaborating with colleagues who work on, on, the, on the camps to teach young migrants photography and documentary making. And we'll give them several cameras, Polaroids and others, and I've asked people to take photos of their own life inside the camp. Um, and we are going to demonstrate their own work. So we may have some of the images I showed of the camp just to show that kind of image of the security apparatus that the European Union and the state wants to project and comment on it and try to deconstruct it through our own works. But I want also to show all the other photographic production of people who live that life inside and want to portray that specific experience in a specific way. So that is as important, if not more important, than the remnants to do with the border crossing that we may also have side by side. I'm keen to get many others who are artists and are painters inside the camp to actually show us some of their own work. So that is so important. So the forgetting that you mentioned, Alex, is to do with that specific moment, perhaps. Um, and it's, 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 it's not something we should necessarily discard because as I said, it has taken a life on its own. You know, the border crossing is, for many people in the West, that kind of iconic image of migration, but for them it's only one, one short moment. Um, uh, thank you. Um, in the introduction also to your book, actually you speak about mobile phones um, as new compressed materiality because mobile phones are what everyone um, these days obviously um, treasures most also and those people have access. Which leads me to a question to you, Stephen, actually. So you write about um, the camera starts as an object, a way of making, but becomes another present member of the family. Um, and you also, you took inspiration, I think, from other photographers also. Maybe you can talk a little bit about um, who were your, um, um, who were the people who you looked up for, for this um, uh, photographic essays that you are working on? Um, the quote that he just mentioned was from an article published by Aperture, um, which is a nonprofit um, for photography. And uh, it reviewed my work dealing with a specific project and uh, different ideas that I'm working with. Um, and when I had made that comment towards uh, the writer Brendan Emser, um, he actually had shown me the work of um, Laura Aguilar and uh, Paola Paredes, who was making um, these really emotional images of uh, Paola specifically was making these really emotional images of her coming out to her family. And she had set up this situation where she was photographing them constantly over and over, just kind of voyeurist voyeuristically, um, to the point that the family didn't notice the camera. Um, and then she kind of um, stabled the camera, shot her conversation with her family at um, this dinner table um, when she came out to them. And what happened in that was it was just this really emotional kind of um, image of how her parents were reacting and eventually how um, there was kind of this acceptance of who she was and then um, she, then they leave and there's just an empty table. And it comes, um, I had made that comment because I did feel like the camera in that situation became part of the family. I think it had to become a part of a family because if not, then they would have, been privy to the camera, they would have seen it, they would have, been, they would have felt uncomfortable. But because the artist specifically was kind of building up, um, they became comfortable and they became collaborative with her. And I found the same thing to happen in my work, that the more I kept shooting my mom um, without direction, uh, the, the less kind of 
um, closed off she would become to the camera and the more kind of collaborative she would be with me. I think my mom will definitely say she didn't know exactly what I was doing and she would sometimes say, why are you photographing me in this way? I don't look, I don't have my makeup on or whatever, but eventually kind of when we were both working out our own emotions about the situation, we realized um, kind of that it needed to happen that way and that the camera became a part of my family and I mean, they know like when I pull it out, it's this big clunky camera with a tripod and it's just like, all right, he's gonna do his thing. And I think um, it was necessary for that to happen because if not, it would have felt ingenuine or it wouldn't felt real um, for sure. Thank you. So, uh, to answer, um, my photographic inspirations are Latoya Ruby Fraser, um, uh, Dana Luxenberg, Deanna Lawson, and um, more recently, uh, Alex Soth. Thank you. Um, Marva also, I mean, um, with the um, role of poets, um, what, I mean, because you read from this little girl also um, from Yanis uh, volume again, and so I think there's also, you have a solidarity in uh, many ways also with people who use words and uh, you teach also here, so Marva is teaching courses, uh, so take her uh, courses here. Um, what is your, um, wish also for poets in these uh, times um, to, um, how can you organize um, maybe um, solidarity? Uh, what are the current ways that um, poets are um, taking to address um, um, I mean, so many things come to mind, right? So like first, in, through our craft, preserving our own languages, so like native, um, and indigenous languages, but also like our native cultures, where we're from, um, you know, like a, that was a refrain in one of the poems, obviously it's quite important to me. Um, and uh, also this kind of idea of colonizing, right? So colonizing those who have colonized us uh, by sort of mocking their forms or uh, inventing forms that kind of push against their language. Um, and, um, you know, the poets are making like a new snapshot, right? So like much like the work that you're doing where we're like excavating objects, uh, we're excavating images and like trying to um, contribute to the imagination, the collective unconscious, if you will, um, and sort of like, you know, just balancing the equation that has for so long centered white male heteronormativity. So, you know, really just m trying to move away from that. But some concrete things that poets are doing um, are actually like, you know, having uh, book fairs where we donate books and then people bid on them. And, you know, one of my books sold for like $91, which is crazy because it's just like 15, 17 back here. Um, and, you know, that money then goes to uh, raise funds for those who need legal help, um, whether they're documented or undocumented. And, you know, there's a, an organization of poets also called Undocu Poets, which supports the work of those who um, have been undocumented and speaks to those issues around undocumentation. But I think part, part of that math also is like, this is why I love like your story as well and your work is that we have to move away from this idea of the migrant being illegal. Like that's a narrative that's not true when so many um, do pursue legal paths and then because the way the system is set, set up, which is what my book is about, um, you become illegal or you become um, at risk of becoming illegal, right? So you're kind of forced into this uh, very like shaky, precarious situation of like, okay, so I grew up here and now you're telling me I'm aging out because my dad didn't do some something and my dad couldn't do that because he had other forces um, working on him within the country. You know, like it, it's just like, well, who do you point to? And you have to point to bureaucracy. You have to point to how the system is set up. And that system was set up by who? White, male, heteronormative. <laughs> folks. So it's like, okay, bye, we're going to make our own system now. And part of that is we have to make a new language for a system without hierarchy. Thank you. Um, we only have time for about two questions um, from the audience, maybe to um, the speaker. So it's not that often that you have three um, yeah, different art um, 
artists also here, so maybe we can start. Amy, you have a microphone, I think. I just want to remind everybody that there are rooms for sale, so mm -hmm. exit slash matrix there. Um, and I'm sure the author will be willing and happy to sign it. Um, and just to piggyback on what um, uh, was last the response to the question, in the A through Z section of tomorrow's book, the Z um, is actually photography related. Zoom in, zoom out, look, I'm trying to show you something. And then, like Margaret does a lot in this book, she's quoting from another source. This is actually a biology article from her father's discipline. Um, the title is Native Fish Diversity Alters the Effects of an Invasive Species on Food Web. And so the idea, it says, um, at the same time, native biodiversity may mitigate the effects of an invader. So this idea of sort of playing with what is an invader and what is being seen as an invader but the idea that increasing diversity of the so-called host um, culture might be a way, that's the way I interpret it anyway. Um, I have a bunch of students here that have questions, so we also have a microphone over there, um, but I'm, I'm gonna put my students here on the spot. Who would like to ask a question? Because we've been studying her book a lot for like four weeks now. So it's a form called the Abyssidarian, um, and I used it because uh, so many of the visas and forms that you have to go through for immigration begin with letters of the alphabet. So for example, I came in on J1, applied for H1B, um, I had IAPs to present, et cetera. That's the short answer. Well, it's work of witness, right? So the work of observation, but also uh, the need to document and share other perspectives. Uh, this ideal of uh, objectivity in journalism is false. So that's why I, you know, broke away into craft, uh, like you know, more creative work, which is still based on, you know, a kind of journalistic training. Um, my question is, uh, when did your family start to really support you, and did that support change the work that, that you made? Sure. Um, my family, I think, always supported me. I think they were um, partially confused with what I was doing because, again, the way that I was taking images was never presented to us ever. I mean, we were just using the image for, for online purposes, right? We were just thinking about the image as a, as a memory or something to look back on, not something to reflect on. And um, so they definitely supported me, but they were confused. And then eventually, kind of when I sat down and, and read them what I wrote and showed the images in a sequence, they kind of understood that heaviness and um, brought them back and just you know, I had to ask for permission to, to publish this story, and I had to, of course, because as much as it is mine, it's, it's my mom's. Like, her name might as well be slapped on here as well, too, and it's my stepfather's. Um, but uh, it was definitely, like, a, a developing trust, even though we're already family. Um, yeah. Hi. I have an open question for our, you guys. I have um, undocumented... Uh, immigrant family that comes from Nicaragua, so I don't know if you know about the situation there, it's not great. Um, but I think that there is a narrative around, it's kind of like a victim blaming thing, like why would you come to the US if your children can be separated from you? Or why would you cross that liquid border if the, you know, you can literally drown? And so I wanted to see if any of you could speak to those conditions and why, what the influences are that makes people migrate um, and why they would take make such a dangerous decision? So. Yes, thank you for all of us. But it's it's a very very important question, and I think it's, it's, you know there's a long conversation we can have about it. 
Um, we could start by looking at the terminology that we actually use ourselves and also what the authorities and the various kind of agencies use. For example, right now there is an attempt to make a separation between the term migrant and refugee. Right? In the European Union context, in many kind of national context, the idea is that if you're a refugee, th uh, that is, if you're fleeing persecution or war, you are entitled to protection. If you're a migrant, you're not, because you're traveling to better your life, you're traveling to find a better job, which is a completely problematic and false dichotomy and shows no understanding of the contemporary situation of what migrants are going through. This is a, a terminology that actually was used post-Second World War to refer to very specific political processes happening then. Now, we know how complex the social and political situation in the world is. Many of the migrants I meant, I meant in the last couple of years come from Afghanistan. And a large number of people right now in the camp of Moria out of the 14,000 who live there come from Afghanistan. You may check the news and see what's happening in Afghanistan right now. Afghanistan, which is seen as a safe country because it has been, after invasion, pacified and done good. I mean, look at what's happening every day how many people are killed every day in Kabul. So if you ask those people why you are here, why did you leave Afghanistan? They would say, how can we live anymore? I mean, it's constant killing, bombs, violence, the situation is so unstable we cannot actually stay here. So can, how can you say that those people are not, um, are not worthy of uh, protection because they left Afghanistan. Or you can talk about to migrants in, in Eastern Africa in other, or Western Africa, and many of them fleeing persecutions of different kinds, as well as the structural violence of poverty. So there's such a complex kind of range of reasons that actually make our own political apparatuses and bureaucratic apparatuses of asylum completely meaningless. So I think I know what to say to those people. I think I can show them through uh, my own engagement with them that all these people deserve protection, but also deserve the right of movement. And many of them actually do not necessarily ask for special status or protection. They ask for freedom of movement. For them, that's the most important thing. You know, they are not in the European Union or in this country for handouts. They are here to actually create a new beginning, a new life, and reshape the country, reshape our countries, this country, countries in the European Union. So that freedom of movement is the most important thing they actually ask, and I think they deserve it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I just want to also commend your language, right? Like you said, victim blaming. Like that's not language that people your age usually like have access to um, in the past, right? So the fact that you can identify it as actually, wait, that's victim blaming. Like they haven't done anything wrong to put their children at risk. You know, like nobody puts their children at risk unless home is the mouth of a shark. The, po the poet Warsan Shire writes. So, you know, you might want to look at her work as well as a kind of uh, source of transformation. Um, so, to kind of, so in El Salvador, there's similar situations um, between MS 13 and just rival gangs and um, how they've occupied different territories within the entire country. And um, to kind of speak to that idea of why would people want to put um, their own children or families in peril, um, I'll answer with this story of my father, who I didn't know, I didn't know what was happening. I went down there um, in April for about five days, right? And I had, I had known that he'd, he'd lived in the same place, the back of his car wash for years, but I didn't really know the situation of the community that he was living in. And within those five days, I kind of spoke with him. I said, why, do you, why are you still living in this, this same neighborhood? Why are you still living in this same community? Do you want to move? Do you want to um, take your family that you have here and move them elsewhere? And he said, well, I would love to, but I can't. And I asked why, and simply because his territory is kind of um, in, under the control of uh, gang violence, and more specifically the MS-13. And he has to pay um, monthly rentals to to that gang, and he has to kind of, um, and if he doesn't, he was told me, he told me that he was he felt threatened, and that they said they would do something to his family, and for him coming here is not even a question that he can't even do it because he can't leave that space because even if he feels like he's running away from there, um, 
something terrible might still happen to his family. Um, and the crazy, the even crazier thing about that is that's not even like a, like a, an outlier. That's a very common denominator with people in El Salvador um, that their communities are you know controlled and terrorized by by first of all MS-13 was like an American-born gang, right? It was because of the mob culture here, and they've deported those people back into our country, thinking that it wouldn't do anything, but it eventually you know ravaged our own country as much as it did um, anything else. Um, so that kind of speaks to that situation. So of course, like if if you can't afford that monthly rent, you're gonna feel like you're going, your family's in danger, you're gonna feel like your family's in peril. So the only choice is to move. And how far you're willing to move is just up to how far the danger um, is for you. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. I'm afraid we have to um, cut off now. So I wanna thank again all of you for coming for this um, yeah, really inspiring, I think, conversation we had here. Yanis, Marva, um, Stephen also for being here, showing your work. And there's an exhibition still of your work, Stephen, upstairs. Um, the books by Yanis and by Marva are available upstairs. And we're looking forward to the exhibition also, um, Yanis, that you are curating with your students. So thank you again and give us an applause, baby, for the speaker. Thank you.